Hi, thank you for watching Digging to China. I'm Dong Shong. If you have not done so already, please subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much. In China, there is a popular saying, Ming yi shi wei tian, meaning people consider food their top priority. Food holds immense importance for both the general population and the ruling elite, a sentiment shared across nations. Food safety remains a major concern in China, and I aim to present a concise overview based on information I've gathered. Your feedback for accuracy and objectivity is welcome. To start with, in China, whatever individuals consume, whether it's crops such as grains and vegetables cultivated directly from the soil or feed for livestock, covering agriculture, uh, forestry, animal husbandry, and the fishery, all originating from Chinese land, I can assert that over 99% of these are likely to possess problems. Irrespective of the labels on food packaging asserting its organic, natural, or green nature across various brands, they invariably exhibit issues varying only in the extent of their severity. What is the primary cause behind this issue? The root of the problem lies in the four decades of China's pursuit of economic development through reform and opening up. Under the leadership of the CCP, the Chinese government has been notably slow in enacting protective measures for vital natural resources like air, water, and soil. This delay is attributed to the fact that investing in environmental preservation demands considerable resource, time, and energy, with relatively modest economic return. Local governments focused on their own survival have prioritized economic growth. Consequently, China currently grapples with severe challenges of air and water pollution, along with a range of other pollutants, none of which have been genuinely and fundamentally addressed. The consequences of such pollution have long-term ramifications spanning decades or even centuries. Environmental degradation can happen swiftly, causing pollution is relatively simple, but restoring it to a healthy state poses significant difficulties. For instance, the pollution of surface water seeping into groundwater may require thousands of years to rectify, and in numerous cases, the harm inflicted on the environment is irreversible. China's environment has suffered damage to an extent of at least 50%, and within the current constraints of human capabilities, these alterations cannot be undone. Firstly, let's discuss the severity of air pollution in China. There used to be a popular joke in Shijiazhuang, Hebei province, which is not far from Beijing. Having lived in Beijing for several years myself, I am well acquainted with its pollution levels. An incident comes to mind where a person took a high-speed train from Shanghai to Shijiazhuang. As the scheduled arrival time neared and the train hadn't yet reached the station, the person's friend called to inquire about their whereabouts, asking, Where are you? Have you arrived? The passenger on a high-speed train responded, I'm not sure where exactly the train is at the moment. All I can see through the window is a pervasive, pervasive haze obscuring everything from view. The friend at the station chuckled and replied, Well, that means you are almost here. Air pollution is a grave concern in both Beijing and Hebei province. Interestingly, whenever Beijing experiences clear weather, it tends to coincide with important events like a national day or official gatherings. Such instances are often achieved through weather manipulation techniques. However, the core issue of pollution remains unresolved. Curiously, companies like SMIC continue to establish factories in major cities like Beijing, Shanghai, Tianjin, and Shenzhen. Establishing semiconductor manufacturing plants in these urban centers presents a significant challenge. The chip fabrication process involves various chemical compounds used in photolithography, many of which are potent air pollutants that can persist in the atmosphere for extended periods. Creating large-scale factories in densely populated cities like Beijing would worsen air pollution problems. This raises the question, what takes the president? Chip production, economic development, or environmental preservation? 
Despite the substantial air pollution resulting from chip manufacturing, companies opt to build in places like Beijing, indicating that environmental concerns often take a backseat to economic gains. This underscores the real conundrum faced by Chinese government in striking a balance between economic growth and environmental protection. In the past few years, international environmental organizations have evaluated the air pollution situation in northern China. Their findings are significant. Individuals residing in numerous cities across northern China face a reduction in average lifespan by as much as 25 months due to the prevailing air pollution. This underscores the gravity of the air pollution issue, directly resulting in a substantial decrease in human longevity. Imagine the impact on the plants and animals that grow in such an environment. Apart from air pollution, there is also a concerning issue of water contamination. Over 70% of China's major water system, including the Liao River, Hai River, Huai River, Yellow River, Songhua River, Pearl River, Yangtze River, have been affected by pollution. In the specific areas such as the Liao River, Hua River, and Yellow River, the Hai River, more than 80% of river segments exist exhibit moderate to severe pollution levels. A significant portion exceeding 57% of China's investigated surface water bodies fail to meet class 3 water quality standards, making them unsuitable for use as drinking water resource. Within urban areas across China, approximately 44% of river sections have been designated as grave grade 5 water quality due to heightened water pollution compared to rural regions. These uh, urban river segments are severely polluted, rendering them unsuitable for any form of use, including basic tasks like watering plants. How about the water quality of extensive freshwater lakes, including res reservoirs and urban bodies of water? In over 75% of these aquatic environments across China, there is a concerning escalation of uh, eutrophication. This phenomenon entails an excessive presence of substances such as nitrone and phosphorus within the water, leading to an imbalance in nutrient input and output. Consequently, the equilibrium among species within these aquatic ecosystems becomes disrupted, with one species undergoing rapid proliferation while others stagnate. The flow of materials and energy within the water system breaks down, resulting in the collapse of the entire aquatic ecosystem. This disruption adversely affects all plants and animal life within the water, serving as a significant manifestation of severe water pollution. This scenario is observed in over 75% of the nation's expensive freshwater lakes. Despite the proactive efforts by various local authorities to address the issues, it's important to bear in mind that as long as China retains its position as the world's foremost manufacturing giant and continues to serve as a global hub for production, the burden of responsibility for pollution management persists. Economic viability remains a key factor. The challenges posed by air and water pollution are likely to endure over an extended period due to their substantial costs and the resource-intensive nature. Regardless of the extent of pollution control measures touted by Chinese government or the achievement of full urban waste management, it's prudent not to place complete reliance on these claims. You can try an experiment on rainy days in mainland China. Put on a white shirt and let it get rained on in any city. Once it dries, observe the marks it leaves behind. This simple test will give you a clear picture of the extent of pollution in China. It's important to note that agriculture, forestry, animal husbandry, and fisheries all operate within this polluted environment, raising serious concerns about the safety of various food products. The question remains, can this issue be effectively resolved? Let me illustrate with a real-life example. A well-known municipal water testing labs in China, entrusted by local health authorities, undertook an assessment of water quality in the largest fish reservoir employed for an agricultural purpose. The evaluation adhered to nationally prescribed benchmarks encompassing a comprehensive spectrum of parameters, ranging from oxygen consumption to diverse chemical constituents. 
conditions, totaling over a hundred criteria. The findings were startling, revealing numerous metrics significantly exceeding permissible thresholds. Perhaps most concerning was the excessive presence of antibiotics, a deviation that surpassed the national limits by an astounding factor of over a hundred thousand times. China has defined safe concentration ranges for various antibiotics, typically spanning from 20 to 32,000 nanograms per liter in water. How did it end up exceeding the limit by more than 100,000 times? This occurred because these reservoirs have been outsourced to businesses that engage in high density aquaculture, leading to significant water quality problems. In this scenario, the local health authorities enlisted the services of a water supply lab to conduct the testing. The results of the tests were troubling. However, the local Environmental Protection Department's lab assessed the same reservoir and concluded that it met the standards for Class 3 water, which is suitable for drinking. On the other hand, the results from the water supply lab commissioned by the health department indicate that the reservoir fell to class 5, signifying complete pollution and rendering it unfit for any use. These two reports present entirely different findings, showcasing a clash between the two departments. Ultimately, the decision was left to the city government, which was reached a few days later. Going forward, the responsibility for testing the source water will be under the jurisdiction of the Environmental Protection System, and the results from the Health Department's testing will no longer be taken into consideration. Whether the fish and the crabs bred in these reservoirs pose any health risks when consumed by humans in a matter for individual to ponder. Notably, this reservoir is situated not far from the renowned Yangcheng Lake, where the crabs from this reservoir upon close examination appear virtually identical to the highly regarded Yangcheng Lake hairy crabs. The question arises, are you consuming authentic Yangcheng Yangcheng Lake crabs or inadvertent pollutants. In China, there is a widespread problem of antibiotic misuse, which extends beyond the fish to encompass the entire spectrum of meats, including poultry and livestock. Over the course of almost a decade starting in 2010, specialized institutions have gathered urine samples from school-aged children in the Jiangsu, Zhejiang, and the Shanghai regions. The results of this extensive data collection revealed the presence of 21 different types of antibiotics. Another investigation conducted by Fudan University's School of Public Health focused on analyzing urine samples from over a thousand children in the same region. This study unveiled substantial traces of antibiotics like gentamicin and enrofloxacin, substances typically intended for use solely in livestock and poultry. Researchers unanimously concurred that these antibiotics originally intended for animals are inevitably finding their way into the human body through the consumption of food, causing considerable harm, especially to infants and young children. An individual with previous experience in investment banking shared that during his time in Shou Guang, Shandong province, he was involved in an investment venture concerning China's largest vegetable cultivation center. He observed a curious practice among local farmers in Shouguang. They would allocate small plots of land near their homes for personal vegetable cultivation, while the substantial quantities of vegetables produced in large-scale greenhouse facilities were destined for commercial purposes. This highlights a noticeable disparity between personal and commercial vegetable production strategies. The outlined circumstances are the root cause behind the compromised origins of China's food supply, air and water pollution, widespread misuse of fertilizers, chemicals, and pesticides contribute to this problem. As a consequence, China's food safety concerns have their origins deeply ingrained within its agricultural, forestry, animal husbandry, and fisheries sectors.
The pervasive environmental pollution in China and the indiscriminate excessive application of medications during the cultivation process create fundamental obstacles that cannot be effectively resolved when tackling the foundational issues underlying these food-related challenges. Until now, despite substantial efforts by the Chinese government to combat pollution, significant results are yet to emerge. The first reason lies in the long-term ecological damage caused by natural processes, which cannot be resolved by isolated measures. It necessitates extensive collaboration among numerous government departments, a challenge within the structure of the Chinese Communist Party system. Officials may rotate positions, making it challenging to sustain consistent environmental efforts in one location. So, what has the Chinese government undertaken for environmental preservation? Essentially, it has transformed visible pollution into hidden pollution, creating the illusion of improvement while underlying issues remain. This strategy is a characteristic approach of the CCP. Does China export food to the United States and the European Union that undergoes stringent food inspections? Yes, but this comes at an exceptionally high cost. The enterprises involved in such practices demonstrate the intelligence and the resourcefulness of the Chinese people. They either sell their products at a premium price or employ tactics of rebranding. Take, for instance, the case of a Jilin based brand known for its Black Mountain pork. While a minor portion of that pork meets the EU's export criteria, the majority of their pigs raised across various locations do not align with these standards. Nevertheless, they utilize a small fraction of EU compliant pork to establish their brand's pedigree and authenticity. They then label all their other pork products with EU compliant tags for sale in the domestic market at elevated prices. Reflect on this can the Black Mountain pork you consume in China truly be considered EU standard compliant? The reality suggests otherwise. For local governments, the challenge lies in weighing economic gains against scrutiny of food safety origins. This dynamic gives rise to a complex web of hidden interests, where meeting or not meeting standards is determined by the by the dictates of these interests. Being part of this chain means that even non-compliance can be treated as compliance, illustrating the concept of a rent-seeking power model. We have covered the foundational aspects of food safety related to its origins, but this is just a fraction of the entire picture. The concerns extend even further into the realm of food processing. Due to space limitations, we will conclude our discussion here for now. And in the next installment, I will delve into the issues pertaining to the food processing process. Thank you for watching. Please leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. Just click the subscribe button right here. I'll see you again shortly. Until then, be well.